Hey friends, so for today I want to make a video about school and I think school is probably one of the biggest topics that I have very strong feelings about and it's something that I've been writing about and talking about for years and years ever since I was in school, long after I've left school and I could probably do 5 to 10 hours worth of videos about school and uh, that's not a, I'm not going to start now and do a 10 hour video now but uh so i should just start i guess i did a bunch of searching on my twitter to see what i've said in the past and there's honestly way too much stuff to put in one video so i have to make some editorial decisions and just kind of at the same time i want to just get a video out of my system so i'm just going to roll with it the original title i was thinking of for this video was going to be school is the worst experience i've ever had which feels like uh might be a little bit polarizing more so than i intend i do want to have kind of a constructive and healthy discussions about school and so i think i'm probably going to title it something closer to maybe schools outdated i should start with my experience i guess uh so i was born in 1990 in singapore and uh i'm 30 years old now it's 2020 i went to school you know, I went to nursery and kindergarten and primary school. So we have primary school and secondary school. And then after secondary school, you typically, you either go to junior college, which is preparation for university, or you go to polytechnic, which is uh, where you get a diploma and something, and then you get a job typically. Or uh, some people go to polytechnic and then go to university afterwards. Or you go to ITE, which is like a technical institution where you learn kind of a I guess trade skills and uh, well, where do I go with this I there are multiple videos that I could be making uh, so part you know so I have criticisms of school as an institution in general I have crit criticisms of school that might be specific to the Singapore system but it's challenging to kind of um, be precise about what is uniquely Singaporean and what is not. I have had a lot of conversations with friends from other countries, so I do have some perspective, but I'm still figuring this stuff out. And where do I want to start? I think, you know, I used to watch a bunch of videos by Ken Robinson. You can still look him up on YouTube and he has like TED Talks and other talks where he talks about it through the frame of learning and curiosity and uh, his criticisms of school are very well framed and very compassionate, very funny, which I would like to embody. I think uh, it's good to have humor in your criticism so that people kind of um, don't get too defensive. Because I don't, I don't want to get into kind of a, a tedious fight with people about whether school is good or bad or whether you know like like I've, I've had several of those fights many of those fights over the years and it it's not very productive after a while it gets pretty repetitive and i feel like it doesn't really move the needle very much and so the needle that i want to move is that i do sincerely believe that school is extremely outdated it was i agree with ken robinson when he says that it was designed kind of during the industrial revolution and kind of in the kind designed to serve it and designed in the image of it and you know the world that we live in right now a while ago i saw like just today i saw a tweet that was something like uh you know the way the human brain evolved and this is nothing to do with school but just as, as a side note the way the human brain evolved it's like layer upon layer upon layer and it doesn't it doesn't remove the lower layers right so you still have like this limbic system and this 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 kind of fight flight lizard brain sometimes they call it and then the, the kind of inside back of your head and then you have layers that go to the front and um, similarly very often when people try to kind of a reform a system or i don't know how you want to talk about it but it's a very it's there, there are new layers on top but the fundamental layers remain largely the same we still sort children into classes by date of production right of the child your age and we still have you know standardized testing which 
perhaps once upon a time it made sense because it was maybe the best solution available at the time given the technology given the the circumstances you know i i try to represent my opponent's points of view in the best possible light i can because i'm not interested in winning arguments and looking good i'm i'm interested in really trying to cultivate systems of of real learning right and i feel that school is not a place that is optimized for learning it's really it's optimized for testing right and it's optimi- optimized for standardiz- standardization uh it's child care right which is a necessary thing in society that that children i mean again how necessary it is 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 debatable depending on how you choose to look at it um if i can i don't it increasingly seems likely that it might be possible but uh you know if i could homeschool my children if i have i mean so i don't i don't currently have children but if we did have kids uh i i think i would like to homeschool them if possible but i also understand that you know it may not be possible and the kids may not even want it you know if you talk to the kids so i'm i'm wary of imposing excessively my ideals and my beliefs onto other people so you know i would be talking to my kids as early as i can as as you know i i think people underestimate children and i i was a child who was underestimated and i had a lot of friends who were also underestimated and i think children are capable of much more than we give them credit for and i think the the environment of school it it forms a frame around which children grow right and it it imposes certain limitations about what they are capable of and how much agency we grant them and how much freedom they have and how much ownership they can take about their own learning and then you know there's there was a there's a quote or a joke or something somewhere that says if people had to go to mandatory school to learn how to walk within a couple of generations we would think that you can't learn how to walk without going to school walking school right and what else uh i'm a very big fan of m- music teachers who have a very immersion led pedagogy of learning uh so victor wooten the bass player and gutri govan the guitar player they're both amazing musicians very talented very skilled very empathetic very sensitive and they both describe a way of learning that is very much a form of immersion there's this economist i think his name is robert frank if i got his name correct and he talks about so he wrote a pretty cool book about economics and thinking in terms of economics and he describes how when he vol so he learned spanish in school for 4 years right and he at the end of it he still wasn't very good at speaking spanish and then he volunteered i think with the un peace corps or something of that some kind of organization like that that was very much embedded in the scenario that they are in and over there he he was in nepal i believe and he learned nepali nepalese he learned the nepali language and the way they did that was over just 13 weeks they would practice the language as if they were children they would they would do this child like simplistic versions of practice and then they would evolve from there and he found that 13 weeks of practicing the language like a child was superior to 4 years of spanish education in school and what's the difference you know it's a uh, you're training with the material that you're going to be using like in the field for real and that you aren't being kind of tested in some kind of standardized testing system standardized testing is a joke in in my opinion it's really you know we don't live in a standardized world we don't have standardized tests in real life we have to deal with life as it happens right and and really the existence of standardized testing is so that we can grade kids on a curve so that we can put them in a chart it's really it's it's to serve the system that wants graded kids graded humans right to to put you in a some kind of ranked system and that system is not actually very much in it doesn't serve the students it serves the employers to some degree and it doesn't in from my frame it doesn't even serve the employers best in the long run it's just kind of a short run thing where 
you know, what you really want in most organizations is you want people who are creative, people who are resourceful, who can, you know, when, when faced with one difficulty, they are able to reroute and go another way, find an alternate interpretation, find an alternate solution to the problem, coordinate with other people, right? And school is very bad at teaching this because, you know, and also, you know, you're, you're, you're trained by school to do tests where you're graded, you know, on a scale of 1 to 100 or whatever, and everything has a right or wrong answer typically. Or, you know, even with, like, essays or whatnot, you're still, you're still graded on a curve or something, right? You, you, can't, you can't score 10,000 on a test, right? And in real life, you can. There's a quote from Jeff Bezos, I think, and whatever you think of him, his point is that in, in uh, the marketplace, you can potentially mix, you can hit a home run that scores in the thousands, right? There's a chance that you might get something right get it so right that it's so valuable that people will pay for it, people will want it, desire it, whatever, however you want to frame it. You can have wins that are outsized and there's nothing in school to prepare you for that. School, in fact, conditions you to not see that. And, you know, like when I sit around making YouTube videos, I, I hear from people saying things like, why do you bother making so many videos? And I'm like, I don't know in advance which video is going to really resonate with people and get shared widely. And, you know, it hasn't happened yet, and it may not happen for years, but I know from experience with my writing that if you keep making videos and you keep, you know, eventually you will, by accident, make something really, really good in in terms of how the market receives it, right? You will, And that's something that school really doesn't train you to see because the test is fixed, basically, more or less. And uh, I took down some notes. I have so many things to say about this. All right, what's, what's the most important thing in life? It's, it's an important question, right? What's the most important thing in life? I think it's relationships. And it's not necessarily relationships with other people. It's also relationships within yourself, between, your, between various facets of yourself. If you want a happy life, you have to have happy relationships. Even if it's only with yourself, you have to respect yourself. You have to like at least some part of yourself you have to you know you you have to have a healthy relationship with yourself and okay how do you have healthy relationships what's the most important thing in having a healthy relationship i think it is attentiveness and uh, there's many different kinds of attention but you know i'm talking about the kind of um, loving trusting you know curious sincere genuine attention that comes from this is good, this is right, this is nice, I like this, right? That kind of attention. And school does not make space for you, like broadly, does not make space for you to cultivate your attention, right? Does that make sense? The, the, sen- the thing that school typically does is it asks you to pay attention, Pay attention to the teacher, right? Pay attention to the textbook. And that, the, 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 the sense is, if you're not paying attention, something's wrong with you. You have the attention deficit disorder because you're not paying enough attention. But where is the attention being directed? You know, what is it that you choose to pay attention to? Is it wrong for a child to direct his or her attention to video games, for example. Like a decade ago, I think people would almost universally, two decades ago, I don't know, at some point, right? It was almost universally agreed that being distracted from school by playing video games is clearly bad and wrong. And today, for some kids at least, right, they make a living doing that. They play video games and they, they compete in esports. There's attention for it. Be- because at- there's attention, right? Like, like, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but but connect the dots. There is genuine interest in video games. And there is genuine value in being good at video games and having good opinions about video games and, you know, being able to comment on video games. This, uh, <laughs> it's just... Who's to say how attention should be directed, you know? Like, if school were really good at... You, you go through whatever it is that we put you through and then you will come out. If I could guarantee you that when you go to school, you're going to come out well-adjusted, 
with good relationships with yourself and the people around you and you will be economically productive and useful and and you know you will be happy and satisfied like if those were things i could be assured of i would be an advocate for school i would encourage people to go to school right but uh i am not persuaded i'm not persuaded that school does those things in fact i have way too much evidence to the contrary i meet way too many people who have been traumatized by school who've had their wills broken by school who've had their imaginations you know kneecapped kneecapped uh hamstrung by school and a, a kind of frustrating thing to deal with is that when people's imagination has been you know limited when your minds have been cauterized right you then lack the machinery required to see what is missing and so it doesn't seem like there's anything wrong i i've spent my time having conversations with those people and and it's very unproductive and so i'm going to choose to not do that i focus my attention on people who feel the pain and have seen the loss you know and a, a thing that took me pretty long to realize was that I was very much radicalized as a child by books. I have a separate video about reading and books and libraries, and my experience of reading and learning on my own from books was such a privilege and pleasure and joy and it's exhilarating. It was so good that when I went to school and was subjected to that, you know, that box-like environment, it felt like agonizing. And I do think it's true that not every child feels the same way. I think some kids don't... Again, they never had exposure to what real learning looks like. And so when they're in an environment that doesn't encourage them to really learn, and it's just about passing tests mostly, they don't really see what they're missing out on. Mostly they might see that, oh, you know, I'm missing out on some fun. I don't get to play games with my friends as much because I got to study for a test. That's... You know, that's all right. Like, uh, I, I just, it, it makes me very, very sad because, you know, one of my tweets is that there was a time where, where it was completely ordinary for, for like many women to die in childbirth and children to die in childbirth. And people just kind of accepted it as, as part of life. It's normal for people to die in childbirth. Like, that's just, sometimes it happens, you know. A pregnancy can be a death sentence. And for, for many, many years, I'm sure, lots of people just accepted it, right? And similarly, I feel like creative minds die in school every day, creative souls. And we just don't, we don't feel it because we don't see it. You know, there's no, there's no grave for a creative soul. But once in a while, when somebody happens to go through school, or maybe they bypass school entirely. Da Vinci didn't go to school, right? Abraham Lincoln didn't go to school. Billie Eilish didn't go to school, right? When, when people who don't go to school, or they manage to survive school with their creativity intact, we then venerate them and we worship them as geniuses, which I think does a disservice to them as well. And our relationship with these people is way too, you know, we pedestalize them as though there's something very special about them. But they're almost just, you know, they were lucky in some way to have survived. Like, like, like intellectually, spiritually. Again, when I say spiritually, I mean like creative spirit. Not, not necessarily in a, in a metaphysical way. But like, you know, when they, when they survive intact, we then describe them as exceptional you know, I, I've been described this way by people sometimes. Sometimes when I have this conversation, they're like, oh, you know, you're special, you're so creative, and you're so, you're so charismatic. And I'm like, all oh, that shit is stuff that I learned. You know, it's not, I wasn't born this way. I mean, there, there may be some, I don't know, I might, so I might have something adjacent to what you would call ADHD. Uh, I might have a slightly different mind in some ways, but I don't, believe that i'm that special you know that i'm such a unique rare meteor on the sky right i believe that and when you talk to children you get to see this every child almost every child is naturally creative and curious you know you can i i, I keep lists of tweets again there's this there's this bit about how Children who write poetry, when they start writing, it begins out very fresh and imaginative and, and true. 
and and surprising. And then when they go to school and then they they develop there's this essay that there's this article that says they develop a thoroughly socialized consciousness. They learn how normal people talk and then they become boring and stale and predictable. There is some utility in learning how normal people are so that you can, you know, in have dialogues with other people, you can interface with other people, but all of the valuable things in the world come from people who who have cultivated their taste, right? And taste is discernment. Taste is knowing what you like and what you don't and why. Like what is it that what is it about what you like that you like, right? And that's how you make a six, Sistine Chapel. That's how you make Lobotin shoes. That's how you make Game of Thrones. That's how you make KFC chicken, right? <laughs> you just have this obsessive curiosity and interest in something. And you just keep at it and you, you figure it out. You dig into it. You explore. It, it takes years sometimes, often, right? Of exploration and, and screwing around and, and, and fiddling and tinkering. And then you make something really great. And then society worships you for it or they venerate you for it, right? But these don't have to be, you know, 0.1% of the population, I'm pretty sure it could be 10%, 20%. You know, maybe you're going to say that it can't be 100% because some people are just naturally naturally averse to making things, naturally averse to using their minds, naturally averse to being playful. But, you know, don't all children love to play in some way? Some, some, so some will love books. Some won't. Some will love to dance. Some will love to sing. Some will love, you know, like... Every child has some different thing that they enjoy, that they explore and they play and they have fun. And school does not honor that. It does not. It you know, if you're lucky you might have like some co curricular activity, you might get into sports or you might get into music or something, but like it's just so sad how how there's this system that systematically you know, regiments, people. And, you know, I served in the military, right? I have a video about that as well. Uh, my video is kind of the bigger picture thing. I might do. I might make a separate video about my military experience. And military is about regimentation, right? You, you, you cut your hair, you shave, you do your, wear your uniform, you, you hold your rifle, you, you do your drills, left, right, left, right. But I found military to be less, my military experience, to be less dehumanizing than school was. And well, okay, my military experience was only for two years and I have like reservists every other year or so. Um, and yet I felt like there was less bullshit in the military. I, f I didn't f perceive my superiors to be lying to me as much, which is, a, you know, so what I'm about to say is I, I don't even like saying it, but it's true. The school lies to kids. Like I, I hate saying that and I want to be careful with my words but like you know school is not a fundamentally honest place in my opinion Re reflecting on my experiences and reflecting on on the utterances that i've seen and uh, i have a bunch of examples about this kind of thing you know um just and i don't even feel entirely comfortable talking about it because there's there's some shit from from <sighs> I should have to, to try and figure out some of the things I want to say. Like, um, you know, it's just... They're not... The, the, the institution, right? I, I don't mean to insult teachers or, or school administrators. I have friends who are teachers. And those of my friends who are teachers are some of the nicest, kindest people that I know. And they are almost universally struggling because they find that their responsibilities as teachers is, you know, teaching is like 10% or 20% of their jobs, right? Like, they, they, they want to do it because they want to make a difference to kids. And they have to almost do it in the cracks, in the little spaces that they get between what is the bulk of their experience, which is assessment and testing and training children to pass tests. And, you know, uh, to be honest with children about the nature of tests and the nature of school and the role of school in society and, and 
you know, what education is for. And, and there's, there's this kind of lip service that's paid to the idea of learning. When I, I honestly, you know, I have some tweets about how it would almost be more honest for teachers and principals to say, welcome to child jail. You know, this is where your parents didn't have enough resources to afford personalized instruction for you. And so you have been given the state, the, you know, the nationalized option. Uh, we do not have enough resources to devote, you know, in, enough teachers to be attentive to your personal needs and to figure out what's best for you. So welcome to the to the meat grinder, kids. And, uh, you know, all the best. Try to... Good luck making... Try and make some friends. Try and, and find some meaning in this hellhole. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm cynic. <sighs> but, uh, you know, if you come out at the end of it with good grades, it you know, you have successfully jumped through some hoops and now you can jump through... You've qualified to jump through some of the better hoops and maybe you can crank out some of the higher prestige widgets instead of the lower prestige widgets and you get more money. Good luck. You know, that kind of truth-telling is very far removed from, from school, right? They will say things... In Singapore, we say things like, every school is a good school, right? And I think in the US, there was phrases like, no child left behind. And, you know, and just this sense of, uh, you know, here is where we will develop your values, right? And we'll teach you about leadership and, and integrity. And, uh, oh my goodness, it's just... Ah... Uh, it's it's so bizarre. It's so... You know, I, I have no solutions for the big picture problems. I do not envy anybody who's like a, you know, a minister of education, secretary of education, or even a principal administrator of school. Because when you're running a school, you have... It's such a complex system of incentives. When I was younger, I didn't quite appreciate just how kind of entrenched these circumstances are. But like, you know, even if you're... A, if you're a school where the teachers and the principal and the administration, they all kind of have very um, grand ideals about giving children the best possible education to prepare them for life. Like the children's parents may disagree. You know, is, you know, how, messed up, how, how wild is that? Like, you may want to educate your children by teaching them about life. And there are movies like this, right? Like uh, Dead Poet Society and stuff like that, where, you know, the teacher tries to prepare the kids for life as they see it, try to give them perspective and, and, and agency and independence. And I don't remember what happens in that movie, apart from the fact that there's a kid that kills himself. But, you know, um, there are parents, at least in Singapore, I know this happens. There are parents who will say things like, stop teaching my child how to think and how to be independent. I, I, what, what do I pay you for? You know, I pay you to get my kids good grades so that they will get more status in life. That's, that's where we are at, you know, in my opinion, from, from what I've seen. And so again, I, I do not envy school administrators. I do not envy teachers. I am very thankful for their sacrifice and their service. But uh, I think that if we want to nudge school towards a better equilibrium in the future, all progress, in my opinion, will have to happen outside of school. And I get, I get that I'm talking about this from a kind of, uh, you know, first world internet having perspective. There are places in the world where people are still illiterate and, you know, sending and where girls don't go to school. And, you know, like having those girls go to school to learn to read and write, like that, that basic level of education, like, like basic schooling, reading, writing, arithmetic, like that stuff is kind of crucial. Like I, I'm not going to dispute that. But it's the, you know, like I went to school, so I had t two years of, one year of nursery, two years of kindergarten, six years of primary school, four years of secondary school. But I would say by the second or third year of my secondary school, I was pretty much done with what I needed from school, you know. Realistically, if if I if if adult me could have designed a system for my younger me, I feel like I could have been mostly done by the time I was maybe 15, 16, like from like all the things that you you kind of need to know basically. And then after that I would invite the child to 
explore their own curiosities and find ways in which their curiosities are adjacent to what would be economically valuable. This is something you can do. I can do it. I know how to do it. I'm doing it for myself and I help my friends with it as well. But like, it doesn't, it, I haven't figured out a way to make it scale, right? And uh, I'm sure there are lots of people working on this problem in lots of different angles and I think it's good that we all kind of reach out to each other and interface with each other. We almost want a P2B, P2P social web of learning and... and I'm getting ahead of myself. I kind of lived through lived through what I would say is the transition. So if there was no internet, I think I would have a harder time making the cases that I'm making. Uh, if there are libraries, I do think it's possible for an individual to have a superior education from a library than from school. I do believe, I do believe this. Uh, I mean, again, and there's, there's, there are guilds, right? So if you want to, and by guilds, I mean specialized um, jobs or, or, you know, specialized professions that require specialized training. So, you know, you don't want a self-taught surgeon. You want a surgeon who's been to medical school. That's, that's straightforward. You know, you don't want a self-taught pilot, right? You want someone who's gone to flight school. You don't want a specialized a self-taught lawyer although you know was abraham lincoln a self-taught lawyer i'm not entirely sure but you know with law it gets a bit hmm. um but for a lot of everything else whatever it is that you want to learn you don't necessarily need to go to an institution to learn it for many years right and we know that you know so now like my nephews and niece as children they are like growing up on youtube in a sense right they watch videos all the time and the thing about you a place like youtube is that you get to see and learn from the absolute best of the best in the world right and one of my favorite videos is you know i, I love uh, bill words is that his name he made the history of japan video and the history of the entire world i guess video and both of those videos are such excellent ways to learn um crash course by john green and uh, hank green and their team it's another excellent way to learn history. It's an excellent. Way. There's so many different topics you can learn, and people. I'm. I, I do believe that like teachers show these videos in classes because they know that they can't quite beat a presentation by people who are one very passionate about the topic, two have the resources to kind of you know present things in a way that is interesting and exciting. I do not believe that learning has to be painful and boring and and divorced from you know, contemporary concerns and, and whatnot. Like, learning should be... It should be making connections between what you care about and what you're interested in. And, and you should be able to connect the dots between those things. The more connections you have in your head between things... Between different things, even, right? The easier it is to remember things, the easier it is to make meaning of things. You know, knowing that your favorite movie was made in 1997, right? And uh, that was the year that this happened. Hong Kong was no longer a colony of Britain. Like, whatever it is, you know, you just, when you can, you, you, like, things should not be learned in isolation. Like, that's really just for the convenience of the testers. It's not for the conducive, it's not conducive for learning. Learning is about, really, when you, when you understand the full context of things and contextualizing things is a, is a, it's an ongoing process and it keeps going on and on. And, um, just understanding you know, the history of art, the history of science, the history of math and, and the relationships between those things and, and, you know, how when this happened and that happened and these two guys were friends. You know, it's just, I don't really want to get into specifics, but think about the things that you know. You know, everybody everybody has some area of interest where they, they know a lot. I once met a guy when I was in the military, right? And I met a guy who I assumed because of the way he spoke, that he couldn't have been very smart. Like, it's just... just I, I didn't mean that in a dismissive or, or, you know, diminishing way. I just felt like, oh, you know, when we we can't really seem to be to have a very thoughtful conversation. And we were on, like, guard duty in the middle of the night. And I'm like, oh, you know, it's all right. We don't need to talk. And then I think there was a, a fish in a stream, like or like a frog, some something that made noise in the stream. And then he got excited. And then he was like, oh, look, look, look. There's a, it's a mud skipper or something. And then he starts telling me about fish. And he knows so much about fish that I don't know shit about. I'm like, damn, this guy is, he's like one of me. You know, he's a nerd. He, he has an interest and he cares about it. And 
because he cares about it, he learns all the things adjacent to it. And I've seen this, you know, in Singapore, I know there are, there are guys who don't make it very far in school, right? Like, they, they might be dropouts of secondary school or something. But they understand computers so well. Better, way better than me. You know, they understand routers and Wi-Fi and, and Android phones and iPhones and, and what, you know, this, what do you think of this? How do you... Um, load it in a different way you know how do you go into developer tools and just it's, they tinker with it and they figure it out and they learn stuff right and they didn't go to school for that right they they figured it out through trial and error and through interest and curiosity and that is how I'm currently approaching learning music I have this video playlist of me learning music and I do feel like you know for a long time I I had some kind of um, how do you say I had a concept in my head that music is learned, you know, th- there's the music that you can learn by yourself and then to go further than that, you need theory and you need, I'm not saying the theory is bad, but, but bear with me. I felt that you need like this instructions, you need to, to be put through some kind of formal system. Like, I just, I just internalized that at some level, even though it didn't agree with like my broader perspective on learning. But uh, then I discovered, I rediscovered Victor Wooten and Guthrie Govan. And then I, I paid attention to the way they spoke about how they learned music. And a lot of it is, you know, sing the melodies that you like and play them on your instrument. And you figure it out through trial and error. Like, oh, that sounds a bit off. You move it further. Oh, that sounds correct. And then you do that over and over again and you get more and more familiar with it. And then you become fluent. And once you become fluent, you can start enveloping new things and you can learn new things. It's, it's just the, the human capacity for learning is so big. It's so massive. School does not account for this you know uh, i've described you know school wants you to be a pocket lighter you know it wants you to be reliable and safe and and predictable and and that makes you vulnerable it makes you you know when 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 a child goes through the entire education system and they come out with just a degree let's say right which not even everybody does but let's say you come out with with some qualifications that's all you have and there's this global system of schools, right? That all a- aspire to churn out kids, new adults, with the same qualifications and with student loans potentially. And uh, I didn't go to university, so I'm really glad that I don't have any student loans. Uh, but you know, and then they because they all have the same skill set, they all have the same qualifications. That makes them all interchangeable. That means that. If you have a certain skill set and qualification set and there's someone from, you know, India or someone from Vietnam or someone from Indonesia or, or Guadalajara in, in Mexico, Mexico, right? Someone else has the same set of qualifications, but they're willing to accept lower pay because they are from, you know, a, a place where the standard of living might be lower, the cost of living is lower, they can afford to accept lower pay, then you're extremely screwed. How are you going to compete? You were trained in the same things. That's, that's, you know, I worried about that when I was like 17. When I was 17 and I was going to school and it just felt like nobody was, and you know, it's especially crazy when you think about being a teenager and having hormones and, you know, going through puberty and starting to care about your peers and status and how to, how to figure out who you are, figuring out your voice, figuring out your values and priorities and expression. Nobody gave a shit about that. I'm mad. I'm fucking angry that I'm still, you know, I can, I can fucking flip the table thinking about this shit. It's really, we underserve our kids so badly because, I don't know what, it's not a priority. We don't care. We don't think it's necessary. It's stupid. It's extremely, oh my God. We, as a species, our failure to educate our young properly with care and attention and nurturance, it is so costly down the line. We cauterize our adults as, you know, and then we set them out into the world and they become, it is true that they then become like, relatively mindless consumers like like you know like you'll see all these i don't know like um edgy woke bros or rational bros or whatever saying you know oh we are all mindless sheep being consumers or whatever it's true 
you know, I'm not gonna make my channel about that, but I have to say they're right. It's true. We do not encourage people to cultivate their attention. We do not encourage people to cultivate their independence. And then, you know, we crush the caterpillars and we complain that there are so few butterflies. It's madness. It really is. I try not to have... I try not to be, you know, kind of a person yelling at a screen, but this is one topic that really sets me off. You know, it's really... Let me scroll through my notes. Uh, what else do I have in here? School does not teach you to be precise in your thinking. It teaches you to follow rules. There are boundaries that you're not supposed to cross and there are questions that you're not supposed to ask. Learning to think clearly and precisely requires being able to open things up and examine them. It requires being able to ask questions like, why are we here? Why, what, what are we doing in school? You know, and that question is not given enough time and attention. Right. And so in effect, by giving children an incomplete or imperfect answer to that question, we're disrespecting them and you're teaching them to be disrespected. I don't think I'm being dramatic here when I say that. I do think that school indoctrinates, truly, you know, and I don't mean to be tin tinfoil hatty about this. I'm not saying there's some grand conspiracy with, you know, some like mystical cabal of people who are controlling all the things and pulling all the strings. No, I'm saying just in ordinary society, regular good people, this could happen in a small, you know, I live in Singapore, it's an island city state, right? It's fairly small. There are no grand scheming puppeteers in charge. But nevertheless, the nature of school, the nature of the incentive systems, the nature of just the way everything is, we teach children that coercion is normal you know not not direct you don't have to say it you just do it you know you just say shut up sit down do your homework don't ask so many questions you know do your homework see what grades you get you know it's just when, when that's that's the system that you're in that's that becomes the, the 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 box around your head that frames your thinking there's this great essay by one of my friends uh, Florent, I believe it's Florent. I hope I got his name right. It's a Twitter friend. Uh, and he says, he is an essay called The Tough Tomato Principle, which says that the process of industrialization and the process of, you know, of producing tomatoes, right? It has to optimize for the output of the whole system, right? And so, one of the most important things about producing tomatoes, if you want to sell them, is to make sure that the tomatoes make it from the farmer to the lorry to the ship, whatever, all the way to the marketplace intact, right? And to do that, you have to breed the tomatoes to be tough. And so, as a consequence, tomatoes have been bred to be tough. Tougher than they would be, you know, tougher than what is ideal for eating. Tougher than what's delicious. And yeah, we can have a conversation about how, you know, but that makes the tomatoes cheaper and more affordable for consumers. So consumers are happier because they can afford tomatoes. Sure. But the point is, you don't, when you then receive a tomato, you're not just receiving a tomato. You're receiving a tomato that has been through an industrial process. And this is the same thing that happens to humans in civilization. I'm not against civilization you know it allows me to have a microphone and a video it allows me to have a conversation with you and uh, i'm very grateful for a lot of the things a lot of the gifts of civilization but we should not be in denial about the trade-offs that we make and and what we lose in the process right this video is already 43 minutes i don't know if i want to keep going i guess i'll just quickly read off more of my notes um school atomizes people in you know it's natural for people to work in groups, to collaborate, so that, you know, I look out for my friend, my friend looks out for me, you know, we take care of each other. You're having a bad day, that's fine, I got you. I'm having a bad day, please take care of me, right? Like, we don't all have to be at 100% all the time. We can work together, we can help each other out, right? Our ancestors presumably hunted and gathered in groups, right? You see it in, when you watch the National Geographic, you see animals do it, hurt, groups take care of each other, right? There's safety in numbers and whatnot. And school 
disincentivizes this. They they train us to think of each other as competitors rather than collaborators because we're all doing the same com- standardized test. If I score a 95 on the test, I'm happy. But if five of my classmates score a 99, I'm no longer best in class. And that means I'm relatively worse off. And you know now I have this anxiety about not being the best and maybe I'm not going to get a scholarship and maybe then I'm not going to get blah, 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 blah. You know, fuck. <laughs> Where... That's not how the world is, you know. That's that. I mean, that's that's not how the marketplace is, in a sense, right? That's so the school, you know, school is trying to serve the economy in some ways, but it's not even accurately modeling the economy. It's this vague, detached conceptualization of the economy. That's not actually how the economy is, which is why employers are always, you know, complaining that they can't find talent right i mean there's another there's another thing about how they don't want to train people they don't want to spend money so they want you know they want cheap talent that's very talented yeah that's also a problem but like you see why i'm crazy all the time (laughs) because it's just the whole system is so poorly optimized it's so archaic it's so atomized and individualized and it's so big that reforming it is a gargantuan challenge. And so I've kind of given up trying to change school. What I'm trying to do is demonstrate what it's like to be a creative, thoughtful, curious, independent spirit. And if I do that out loud, which I've done before, I did it on my blog, I did it on Twitter, it draws people like that to me. And then when we have, we have a group of us we can help each other out in certain ways that's not obvious at the start. And then that's how you build and that's how you, you, you invent the future potentially, right? I, I can't get too specific about this and again, we're very late into the video. But I have been thinking about this for a very, very long time and I care about this very deeply. And uh, I'm scrolling through more of my notes and uh, I don't really want to go into specifics. I just want to wrap up, right? Let's try and wrap up in the next five minutes. Ah, school, man. It's... I, I'm not gonna say let's burn down the schools although when people do say that I'm quite sympathetic I must admit um, I don't think standardized tests make sense in a world where it has become so cheap and easy to collaborate so cheap and easy to communicate these things you know imagine schools didn't exist just just imagine that that you woke up one morning and just for some strange reason, schools just don't exist. Because schools haven't always existed. Schools, you know, God didn't make man and woman and then schools, right? You know, I mean, whatever your religion or belief or whatever. Like, schools didn't come down from the heavens. You know, schools didn't grow out of the ground. Human beings from a different era, from, you know, the 1600s or wherever, decided to come up with state run schools which was probably some propaganda stuff something nation state something something whatever you know you can dig into it but imagine schools didn't exist okay and now from scratch you have to devise a system of educating children preparing them for the future in whatever ways that in whatever whatever sense that means whatever that looks like you know making them economically viable and and just you know whatever what what should kids do if schools don't exist if if schools disappear and we could make anything else instead what what would you do think about it. i i don't have a you know i don't think there's a one size fits all answer but i don't exactly i don't think there's a one size fits all answer the standardization makes no sense it's 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 really it's it's a procrustean solution it compresses everyone into this industrial factory prison right and we can do better we can definitely do better we have learned so much about how learning works you know we've learned so much about how taste is developed and how and you know we we know about apprenticeships right and we know about communities and uh, yeah i i just i have a lot of feelings about this stuff I know that I've probably said a bunch of things that are not technically entirely accurate. That's probably a disclaimer that should go on my entire channel. 
Um, but yeah, that's that's just fifty minutes of my feelings about school. Uh, I will continue to make more videos about school. I'm pretty sure, and education and learning. I don't think you need to go to school to learn. Uh, I don't think we should necessarily pull all the kids out of school. You know, I think what's best right now is that because it's so socially normalized for kids to go to school, let them go to school, I guess. But I think that kids should have access to people who care about them, who aren't their parents and aren't their teachers, you know, their uncles and aunts or whatever, their cousins. And they should hear about the history of schools and, and the purpose of schools and the reality of trying to make a living in the world, doing whatever it is that you do, and what it's like to search for a job, What what's the range of jobs available out there, you know, it's all of those things. Like, we should be honest with kids. We should tell them the truth. They they have, we underestimate them so much. They are capable of so much. They, they really, it's so cliche, it's so, so cliche, but they really are our future. And, you know, we we are counting on them to do better than we did. And I think we can do better than school. Let me know what you think. Right? What's your opinions? You know, what's what's your what? Okay, I don't really want to. Uh, I don't really want the comments to be about you know. Oh, I also had a bad time in school, or you know, I didn't have a bad time in school. Actually, school was great for me. Like, I I don't really. I mean, you can say that if you want. You know, I'm not. I, I welcome all comments. But I guess what I'm hoping to hear from hear about is more of like uh in fact tell me what has your best experience of learning been tell me about the relationship between your schooling and the job that you currently do or you know however you're currently employed or however you make your living right and um yeah i want to know what you learned you know um your your best learning where did that happen how did that happen and your your, your how you make a living and uh what else what else will we need to replace school right um i guess a common thing people always say is that you know oh you know if kids don't have school how are they going to socialize i i don't think that's anywhere close to a problem as people think it is but uh you know i so like i never went to university but I have a lot of friends who did go to university. And there's a lot of us, there's a lot for us to talk about despite the fact that I don't have that one shared experience with them. And I think we really underestimate people and their capacity to connect and find common ground. And again, I think part of the reason people can't see that is because they have been indoctrinated to believe that there are these very narrow paths of human connection and, and, and communication that, you know, you have to have some very narrow shared interests or shared backgrounds or shared whatever that to talk about, which, oh, what a what a miserable life that would be. I, I'm, I'm assuming I wouldn't know. Uh, but yeah, let me end this here and I, I would love to hear what you think. Thank you very much.